Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Psalm 145, I've given it the, the, the title of Eternal Praises to Our Eternal God. And we'll read verses 1 through 4. Then I'll pray. Psalm 145, reading verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> I will extol thee, my God, O King. I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. Father, as I read through this, uh, I, I remember that tomorrow is Thanksgiving. And it is appropriate and timely that we've come to a psalm that is very much uh, just really focused on thanking you and praising you. And we read these verses, Lord, Amen. and praise forever and ever. And you are worthy of our praise because you are a great God. Amen. Your word says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And Father, we want to focus on that tonight. We thank you for your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So you might not be able to see it in English as you're reading the psalm in English, but Psalm 145 is actually an acrostic psalm. And if you don't know what an acrostic is, it's uh, like when you take certain letters and maybe it would be a word. Uh, for example, you've heard the acrostic for grace, right? God's riches at Christ's expense, uh, G-R-A-C-E, or faith, uh, forgetting all I trust him. So these are called acrostics, and if you remember from Psalm 119, which is a very major acrostic psalm, uh, the first eight verses began with the letter Aleph, and every verse in Hebrew, every word begin, or not every word, but the first word of every verse begins with a word that starts with Aleph, and so that's kind of interesting. And this psalm is like that, it follows the Hebrew alphabet <clears throat> with two lines beginning with a Hebrew letter. There is an exception, however, when you come to the Hebrew letter Nun, which is not in the middle of the Hebrew alphabet, but close enough. Um, it's not a part of the, of the acrostic. I don't know why. For some reason, David decided not, include, not to include the letter Nun, so he didn't include that. <clears throat> now, some people actually think that the two lines for the letter Nun have been lost. But that kind of goes against the whole idea of God preserving his word. So if anything's lost, it's them. They've lost their minds. Uh, so I don't think that's it. Um, and I think that the flow of the psalm itself makes it pretty clear that it is intentionally done. It would have occurred between verses 13 and 14. So if you focus to verses 13 and 14, I want you to notice the flow here. It says, thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. The Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all that uh, all those that bow down. And so I don't see like a major break in a thought there. I don't see where uh, something is in my mind missing. And again, because I believe that God preserves his word, um, I don't really think that that's true. They do tend to flow together fairly well. But... In history, since it so clearly lacks the letter Nun, uh, which, by the way, it lacks in all Hebrew manuscripts. There's no Hebrew manuscripts with the letter Nun uh, included in that. Uh, somebody came along, and I don't know who, I tried to find out, but you know that happened a long, 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 long time ago, and so I didn't get the memo, but uh, somebody decided to fill it in. And so as a result of that, if you read the Syriac version, or the, uh, the Greek Septuagint or the Latin Vulgate, uh, and there's a few other translations. There are two other verses in the middle of this psalm that is not in the Hebrew manuscripts at all. Sir? Has that made it like any of the modern translations? No, sir. No, sir. Not as far as I know. According to the Talmud, and everybody knows what the Talmud is, right? It's one of those Jewish writings that's very important to them. Uh, this particular psalm is recited twice in the morning service and once in the evening service, so three times a day. And the Talmud sta states that the man who recites 
Psalm 145, three times in a day, must surely be a child of God. I wish it was that simple, don't you? You just take Psalm 145 and go out and grab some poor lost soul on the street and say, can you read this three times? And ta-da, they're saved. Of course, that's not the way salvation works. But it does show you how much they, uh, they revered Psalm 119. So, of course, it's not true, uh, but that's what they say. Uh, I'm sorry, Psalm 145. I said 119, I meant 145. Uh, according to some church historians, believers, Christians, would recite the psalm at midday, at midday meal, and verses 15 and 16 uh, have been used for the Lord's Supper throughout history as well. You can find sermons and stuff throughout history where they use uh, verses 15 and 16 uh, for the Lord's Supper, which I thought was fairly interesting. Um, the psalm itself begins with, I will extol thee, my God, O King. Um, there are some psalms that we call the Hallel Psalms because they all begin and end with Hallelujah. This psalm is one of those psalms. Uh, we don't see that because it's translated in English. And so we, we kind of don't see that when it's translated in English. Well, what does that mean? That means that, uh, does that mean that we're missing something? No, of course not, because hallelujah means praise the Lord. And so that's what we have here. So we didn't really miss anything. It's just kind of neat uh, the way that the psalm is constructed. Now I've got um, six main points to the psalm. And the first one is the position of God. We'll see that in verses 1 and 2. Then the praise of God, verses 3 through 10. The preeminence of God, verses 11 through 13. The provision of God, verses 14 through 17. The protection of God, verses 18 and 19. And then lastly, the preservation of God in verses 20 and 21. And uh, if you miss some of that, uh, that's all right, because you know we're going to be going through this for the next few weeks anyway, and so you can pick up on it there. Or you can just go out to our website, and uh, you, you can find a list of other resources where the Psalms that I've actually put in print are out there, and you can get all the notes out there for that. You can go to our website, www.hbcingunson.com. Okay, so it's out there. Anyway, so we're going to start with the position of God, verses 1 and 2. And it says, and I'll read this again, this is David's psalm of praise. That's the title, and it says, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee. I will praise thy name forever and ever. It is not only interesting, but I think significant that the psalm begins with the praises of the king of Israel, who is David. But it ends with the praises of the whole world. Notice in verse 21, at the end it says, let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Psalm 145 begins the last five, Psalm 145, verse 6, verse 7, verse 8, verse 9, 50. The last six psalms um, begins, it begins with praise, and they're all psalms of praise. And the last part of verse 21, let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever, kind of draws your mind to the very last psalm in Psalm 150, where it says, yea, and let all that hath breath praise God. So there's a little bit of a, I don't know, a relationship, I guess you'd say, kind of a parallelism there. Also notice that in both passages, this praise is to be forever and ever. He is my God. Notice that. I will extol thee, my God. I will extol thee, my God, and O King. He is my God and King. His name is to be blessed. This is his high position. He is God. We are his creatures. He is King. We are his servants. We do well to remember our place before God as we meditate upon him, as you go to him in prayer, remember who he is and remember who you are. And I guarantee you will get a whole lot more out of your prayer life, a whole lot more out of your time in reading the scriptures when you remember that it came from the God of the universe, the God that created all things. That is his position. Verse two makes the point that this is not a weekly requirement. Now, Wednesday night's a weekly requirement. We come to church on week, uh, you know, weekly. Every Wednesday night we come to church 
and we pray and we bless the Lord in, in our way and we, we thank him for being God. But what, what he points out here is, is it's not a weekly thing that we do. It's not a monthly requirement. It's something. It's not something that we only do on Sunday mornings. That's when a lot of people do it, you know. Well, it's Sunday morning. Not told the whole world that I'm a Christian, so I better go to church. Haven't talked about God all week. Haven't thought about God for the most part. Then on Sunday morning, we come in with our suit and tie on, holy, 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 with a big smile on our face, pretending that we have been blessing the Lord all week when the reality is we've been living for ourselves. This is not something that we do even day by day. This is, this is something that he says is to be done forever and ever. There is no end to the praise of God. And I don't know about you, but that's a challenge to me. It's a big challenge. For those that have a, a good morning devotion, and I hope you do, you should check to make sure that during your morning time with God, that there is some time set aside to praise Him. A lot of times what we do is we approach God in the sense that when we pray, we pray and we say, uh, we may begin by saying, Lord, you know, I thank you that you're God and I love you and that sort of thing. And then we begin to give Him our list. Here's the list, Lord. This is what I need from you. This is what I want you to do. Oh, and by the way, we love you in Jesus' name because that's the send button. Amen. Right? And that's how we pray. But the reality is that's not what praising God is all about. There's a heartfelt thing going on inside of us as we praise the Lord. Now, sometimes we don't feel like praising anything. We don't feel emotionally like worshiping. We don't feel like we want to do anything spiritual. In a time like that, it would be good to take a step back and remember who we are and remember who He is and remember His position. And if we can do that, we'll find it much easier to praise the Lord. Notice now verses 3 through 10 where He begins to speak of the praise of God. Psalm 145, verses 3 through 10. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise the works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow in anger, and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. I like the way this starts out. Great is the Lord. We even have songs on that, right? Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. comes from a different song, but the thought is exactly the same. Great is the Lord. Have you noticed, have you ever gone through the Bible and noticed all the things that talks about God being great or what God is great at or something of that nature. I'm going to throw a bunch of things at you here. So if you're taking notes, hang on. This is going to be kind of rough. But first of all, God is great in mercy. In Numbers 14, verse 18, the Lord is long-suffering. Numbers 14, 18, the Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression and by no means clearing the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. You kind of get lost in the first part of that when you get to the second part of that because the first part is like, yes, and the second part is, uh-oh. Well, it begins by saying that the Lord is long-suffering. Thank God for that. And of great mercy, God is great in mercy. I also find in the Bible, Deuteronomy 29 and verse 24, that God is not only great in mercy, but God also has a great anger toward wickedness. Deuteronomy 29, 24. Even all nations shall say, Wherefore hath the Lord done thus unto this land? What meaneth the heat of this great anger? You know, you can get a little bit upset about something. Or you can get a little angry, or maybe even a whole lot angry. But God is 
His anger is described here as having the heat of this great anger. What is it that caused the heat of this great anger? Wickedness. So don't kid yourself. When you sin, God's not smiling. Oh, that's my child. I love him. I'm just going to forgive him and everything's going to be... God hates sin. He hates it in the life of an unbeliever and he hates it in the life of a believer. And if we continue to walk in sin, trust me, God is not going to be happy with you. He is not going to allow you as his child to get away with disobedience. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 22, we learn something else about the greatness of God. 1 Samuel 12, verse 22 says, For the Lord will not forsake his people. Amen. For his great name's sake. Why is it that God doesn't forget or forsake you? Not because of you. Because if it was up to me, he'd have forsaken me probably you know, 15 minutes after the, the moment I got saved. But no, it's for his great name's sake because he's made promises and he's going to keep them. For his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. You immediately want to say, why? Don't go that far. Just stop and rejoice in the fact that God loves you for whatever reason, and that he, for his great name's sake, will not forsake you. I also find that God's power is described as being a great power that wrought a great deliverance. Notice this, 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 36. But the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt with great power and a stretched out arm, him shall ye fear, and him shall ye worship, and to him shall ye do sacrifice. Why? Because the Lord delivered me by his great power. Now, I've, I've never been to Egypt. Someday maybe I'll get the opportunity to go. It'd be kind of nice to go see Egypt, you know, go see the pyramids and the Sphinx and all of that other stuff that people want to see in Egypt. That would be kind of nice, I guess. But I, having never been to the land of Egypt, still understand the great power of God's deliverance in my life. The Bible says he brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, and he put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. And the Bible says many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. He's done a great thing in delivering us. It was no easy task. It took Calvary to deliver us. I find that God's works are great. Of course. Can a great God do any less? Psalm 92, verse 5. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. That's not something that anyone's ever really said about me. Thy thoughts are very deep, Jim. No, but God, his thoughts are very deep. And his works are great. Of course he does great works because he's a great God. Man can do great things. Sometimes we do great things. I mentioned the, the pyramids. They've stood for a long time. But you know, everything that we do at some point will be gone. But when God does a great work, it's a great work. Notice also Psalm 117 in verse 2. <clears throat> Psalm 117, verse 2, God is great in his kindness toward us. It says this, for his merciful kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Of course, praise ye the Lord. Because his merciful kindness is great toward me. God doesn't give out his mercy like this going, well, I guess I'll give you a little bit. I'll give you a couple drops of mercy here. No, his mercy toward us and his kindness toward us is described in the scriptures as being great. He doesn't hold back. In fact, God is so great that we can't even fathom how great he really is. Going back to Psalm 145 in verse 3. Psalm 145 in verse 3 where we started this. It says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. In other words, I cannot explain to you how great God is. I cannot make you understand how great God is. 
There is no way that I can expound upon the scriptures in such a way that you will completely fathom the greatness of God. It is beyond our understanding. That humbles me. That makes me realize just exactly who I am and that God is that big. I love it in this passage that we're reading here, the descriptive terms that David uses to describe God's deeds. He calls them, in verse 4, he calls them mighty acts. In verse 5, glorious honor of his majesty. Verse 5 says wondrous works. Then in verse 6, terrible. Terrible there doesn't mean bad. We use that word terrible like that today, right? We say something is terrible. You know, like you eat a piece of pizza with anchovies on it, and that was terrible, right? But no, in the Old English, in the King James, terrible means awe-inspiring. It causes you to stop and go, wow, that's incredible. So when you read the word terrible, think awe-inspiring. And in verse 6, it describes his acts as being terrible acts. In other words, awe-inspiring acts. When you read something like that, of course, you begin to think of things like the parting of the Red Sea. Or when he made the river Jordan stand up on a heap. Or as Jesus raised the dead or cleansed the lepers. And you think, man, those are awe-inspiring acts. But I'd like to add to that the fact that he actually saved me. Me. You don't know me. You only know the me that I let you see. But God knows me. And yet he saved me anyway. Notice verse 7. His great goodness. Then in verse 8, full of compassion, slow to anger. Oh yeah, his anger can be a great anger, but he's slow to anger. Great mercy. When I read that about being slow to anger, I, I'm reminded of a, a friend of mine. His wife had two boys and they were kind of rambunctious, let's just say, you know. Not bad kids, but just, you know, they're everywhere. They're bouncing off the walls all the time, you know, pretty rambunctious. And she had put up with them all day. And at the end of the day, she told him it was time to go to bed. And one of the boys was, I guess he was hungry, wanted a snack or something, or maybe there was company over, so he wanted to kind of hang out. I don't know what his problem was. But he told his mom that he wanted a bowl of cereal first. And she said, no, I told you, go upstairs and go to bed. And he said, but I want some cereal first. And she said, ooh, I've been saving this up for you all day. So when I read about God being slow to anger, I think about her. <laughs> she had put up with those kids all day. But there came a point where finally she acted. And then in verse 9, God's tender mercies. And this is how David describes God's deeds. Incredible descriptions. And you might come away after reading through all of this with the general impression that David is really awed by God. We would be too if we took some time to stop and think about it. He's awed by God, and rightly so. After all, the main point is that God is worthy of our praise because He is just that great. He's just that good. I never forget when I was in the Air Force. The, the wolf was talking about whether or not he wanted to give me an extension for one more year. And he uh, called my boss into his office. I worked on the wing staff at that time. He called my boss into, this, into his office. It wasn't him. It was somebody else. No, it wasn't Brother Willie. It was after him. But, but uh, he asked my boss, is he really as good as his jo at his job as, you're, as you say he is? Because he's reading the, you know, the paper. And, and my boss said, yes, he is just that good. Now, I don't know if I really was just that good. But think about the impact of those words. God is just that good. Whether I am or not, doesn't matter. He is. And we need to step back and realize that we are really nothing in comparison to Him. And David knows this. If God were some type of self-centered ogre in the sky that demanded that we worship Him or else, then He would be no better than any earthly dictator. But that's not the case. Our God is is plenteous in mercy. Our God is slow to anger. Our God is full of compassion. 
Our God is a righteous God. Notice this in verse 7. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. And as a result, you read through there and you stop and ponder what each one of those phrases mean. You cannot help yourself but to step back and say, it's easy to praise God. It's easy to extol Him, as it says in verse 1. Why? Because He is just that good. The saints can easily praise the Lord. Look at verse 10. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, even the stars. Somewhere in the Psalms it just came to my head. I don't remember where it's at. Maybe you do. But it talks about the trees clapping their hands. Did you ever read that? Trees don't have hands. It's poetic language, though, to tell us that even natural creation in its own way praises God. The stars, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth His handiwork. We can read in the book of Job where it talks about how all the morning stars sang. And I think those were probably angels. It should be easy for God's creation when we stop and take the time to think about who God is. It should be easy to praise Him. The saints can easily praise the Lord because we know from experience just how wonderful the Lord is. As it says in verse 7, they shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness. Sometimes I think we don't tell our testimonies enough. But we all know our testimony. We know what happened. We know how we got saved. Sometimes I think we don't tell it enough. But you know in those times when we get the opportunity we begin to share with people what the Lord was doing and how He worked in our life and how He saved us. It's a wonderful feeling. It's exciting to, to reminisce, as it says here, the memory of His great goodness. That's what we're doing. We abundantly utter the memory of God's great goodness. We remember God's goodness, His grace, His compassion, his great mercy, verse 8, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion. And his well of grace never runs dry. You can go to that well of grace again and again and again and again. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace. That's what the Bible tells us. Because he is just that good. So our praises are not to be some sort of mechanical exhibition, which is the way it can get sometimes with, with people. Our praises are to come from the heart so that we, like David, take a step back and look at all that God has done. And think of all that He's done in the Scriptures, just everything that He's done with the nation of Israel. And you move on into the New Testament and His Son and all that He's done for us. And now my salvation and it's personal to me. And I look at my life and all that God has brought me through and the things that He saved me out of and the things that He's protected me from and the blessings that He's given to me in my life, a wonderful wife and two wonderful kids and the greatest church in the world. How could I not want to praise Him? It should be easy. It should be easy. So like David, we can step back and be simply awed. Awed by God. In his greatness. Amen. We'll stop here tonight. We'll come back next week and look at the preeminence of God in verses 11 through 13. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your graciousness to us. And Lord, we meditated tonight and just pondered your greatness. And Lord, it is unsearchable. Oh, the depth. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. Father, we thank you for your word as we read in the scriptures about your kingdom and endure throughout all generations. The kingdoms of men rise and fall. But Lord, you're always there. You're always the same. I just think of your word that says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're so thankful for that. We have a rock that cannot be moved. And we want to stand upon that. We ask that, Lord, tonight you just encourage our hearts and strengthen us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
So if you remember from last week, the end of verse 10, the end of verse 10 was thy saints shall bless thee. And I bring that out because we begin in verse 11 with the word they. So when you begin with the word they, you kind of want to look back to see who they are. And in this case, the they of verse 11 is a reference to thy saints in verse 10. So they shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power. For the next few verses, it's not merely the great power or great mercy of God that is brought into view, though those are definitely brought into view. What you find even more so is that there is the, the praise of God because of his preeminence, his glorious, majestic, everlasting kingdom. And a kingdom, of course, demands a king. And in this case, we know that God is that king. So we need, to, we need to kind of get this straight, for lack of better terms. The kingdom of God is preeminent above all. You look around in the world and it doesn't look like that is true. It is true. Mm -hmm. God has allowed things to be the way they are. But in the end, we're going to find, everyone's going to find, that there is no greater power than the kingdom of God. The kingdoms of men are below the kingdom of God. This is what Daniel was prophesying about in Daniel chapter 2. If you'll turn back to Daniel chapter 2 for a moment, verses 44 and 45, without getting into the whole discussion of Nebuchadnezzar and the statue and all of that, this is a statement that we find in Daniel 2, verses 44 and 45. It says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. If you've ever studied Daniel chapter 2, you'll know that the gold was Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold. Then after Babylon came the Medo-Persians. Then after that, the Greeks. Then after that, the Romans. But we find in Daniel chapter 2 that it's when it's all said and done, the kingdom of God is going to smash all the kingdoms of man, and the kingdom of God will stand forever. Even now, the kingdom of God stands. We don't see it with our physical eyes. You can't go to a location on the planet Earth and find a golden city or walls around a kingdom. What we have now is a little different than that, but the Lord still rules. In Daniel chapter 4 and verse 17, it says this, this matter, Daniel 4, 17, just two chapters over, this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know, that they may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basis of men. So God is still in charge. Man might think he's in charge, but he's not. God is. Amen. We like to blame the, the liberals for putting President Biden in the office, the, the public office. But know this. That if God didn't want him there, he wouldn't be there. Also know that even though we don't see a kingdom, we're in a kingdom. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. We learn something about the kingdom, and I don't want to get too much into the, to, to, to the study of the kingdom, but there are some things here I think we need to come to grips with. But Romans 14, verse 17. Speaking of the kingdom of God, Paul writes and he says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. In other words, the kingdom of God is not all about the things we eat or the things that we drink or uh, making application, you know, to whatever we do, the things that we do. The kingdom of God is in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, that's the kingdom of God. Peace, that's the kingdom of God. Joy. True joy, biblical joy. That's the kingdom of God in the Holy Ghost. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 17. 
verses 20 and 21. Luke 17, verses 20 and 21. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now there is an aspect to God's kingdom that will be physical, if you could say it that way. But right now, the kingdom of God still exists, and we've been translated, according to Colossians chapter 1, into the kingdom of God. We are in it now. You go to work, and you look around you and say, if I'm in the kingdom, this sure doesn't look like it's here. It is here. It's within you. So in a sense, going back to Psalm 145 and verse 13, if you'll go back and look at that, it says, thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. So we're not waiting for everything to wrap up because the kingdom of God endureth throughout all generations. That would be including this one. So in verse 13, you look at verse 13, it seems almost prophetic in the sense that it speaks of an everlasting kingdom. But also note that it's speaking of a kingdom that is here and now, and it's going to be everlasting. It's never going to come to an end, enduring throughout all generations. We like to think of the millennial kingdom, but that's in the future. It might start in our generation. I don't know if it will or not, but I do know this, that the kingdom of God is preeminent. God is preeminent, and he is over all. And there is not one king, not one president, not one dictator, no Hitler, no Mussolini, or any other bad guy in history that you can think of that rose to the heights that they rose to without God being involved in that. They didn't do it on their own. God, we sometimes wonder why. Why did God allow this or why did God allow that? To be honest with you, a lot of times we come away from these questions with no answers. We don't know why God allows certain things, but he's got a plan and he knows what he's doing and we need to trust him in that. Now look at verses 14 through 17. Verses 14 through 17, we find the provision of God. Psalm 145, verses 14 through 17, the provision of God. The Lord upholdeth all that fall. And raiseth up all those that be bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon thee. And thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thine hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. Look, sometimes we fall. Sometimes we are bowed down. Sometimes we do things that we know that we shouldn't have done and we look back and we feel miserable. But when we fall, the Bible says that the Lord upholds us. He picks us back up, dusts us off, puts us back on our horse so that we can continue to ride. And when we are bowed down, what does the Lord do? He rises us up. He lifts us up again so that we can continue to serve him. And the end result of God's provision is, in our time of need is that our hearts are filled or should be filled with admiration and praise toward him because we didn't do it we didn't get up on our own to be honest with you there are times when we would rather not get up at all can't stand the fact that i failed the lord i'm just not going to do this anymore peter tried that didn't go so well we talked about him in the van on the way here the Lord has a way of bringing us back around. He does that. Verses 16 and 17. Notice those. 16 and 17. We have to understand these in the context that whether man may understand it or not, he waits on the Lord's provision. All of these people that you see in the city and on the base that are walking and going here and there, and they think that their job is what sustains them. The Lord makes it to rain upon the just and the unjust alike. Anything good comes from God. Every good gift, every perfect gift, the Bible says, comes down from above. It doesn't come from our work. It doesn't come from what we do. God does it. So even though they may not recognize it, they do not realize it, but even they are waiting on the Lord's provision. If God should choose not to provide, then they would not, then, then they would not have it. Wouldn't it be weird if you woke up one morning and realized that God decided not to give you air? 
what would you do? Well, die, <laughs> right? Die. What if you woke up and all of a sudden you couldn't move? That's actually happened to people. God provides. And if God should choose not to provide, then we would be lacking. Remember, David stated in verse 9 that the Lord is good to all. Doesn't matter who they are. He's good to all. Those who do not deserve it and those that do. Jesus used this very principle to teach us how we should love our enemies. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 and 45. But I say unto you, love your enemies. That's hard. He could have put a period right there and that would have been challenge enough. But he doesn't. He goes on. He says, bless them that curse you. You know what we like to do? Somebody is our enemy and we like to, you know, go home and tell our, our wives about it or, you know, tell our friends about it and say, you're not going to believe what my boss did to me today. And we like to talk badly about them, but Jesus says to bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. I got that one. Strike them, O Lord. I'm pretty sure that's not what Jesus meant. I'm pretty sure he meant the other way. Verse 45. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. But whether God provided or not, the Lord is righteous in all his ways, and holy in all his works. And the child of God would do good to remember that. The child of God does not complain about the actions of the creator toward the creature. I was talking to somebody earlier, I think it was Brother Willie actually, we were talking about uh, questioning God. And I think we all do that. Uh, sometimes we question God to try and understand what's going on. What is it, Lord, that you're trying to teach me? What is it that you want me to learn? What direction are you trying to give me? And so we question God and we say, Lord, why is this happening? What's going on here? Why, why are you turning my whole life upside down? What are you trying to show me here? What is it that I don't see that I need to see? And we question God because we want to be in his will. We want to know what he's doing. We want to know what he's trying to show us. Or you can question God by saying, why, God? Why did you do this to me? As if we don't deserve whatever bad things happen in this world. If you think about it, we deserve far worse. What we deserve is hell. Anything short of that is grace. We need to keep that in mind. The child of God should not complain about the actions of the creator toward the creature. We need to know, we need to understand that no matter what, God is righteous in all his ways. Holy in all his works. God is perfect. He's perfect in character. He is perfect in knowledge. He is perfect in his deeds, in everything. So we'll stop here tonight. We'll come back next week and look at the protection of God, picking up in verse 18. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word and the encouragement that we have. Lord, we're about to go into a time of prayer. And knowing that you're preeminent and knowing that all of your works and all of your ways are righteous is an encouragement to us. There'll be many things that we pray about, many things that have been mentioned and other things I'm sure that we'll think of that we need to pray for. Yeah. And being able to trust it in your hands and know that you're righteous in all your ways. And Lord, if we do question you, may it be only that we might know what it is you're trying to show us. And never in the sense that we, we how dare we think that we could ever call you out on the red carpet to answer for what you do. We're your creatures. We're your children. You're our Father. Help us, Lord, to remember that. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll be dismissed. We'll break up into our groups and go to prayer. <clears throat>
and we have worked our way down to verses 18 and 19, and in verses 18 and 19, the focus is on the protection of God. So uh, I'm going to read that, and then I'll pray, and then we'll get into the devotion tonight. Psalm 145, verses 18 and 19. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. Lord, as we read your word, as we ponder the truth of the scriptures, Lord, speak to our hearts. The, the Psalms are so devotional, so encouraging. So many things in the Psalms that we can, we can grab a hold to that will give us Lord, great encouragement for our day. And we ask, Lord, now that you'll speak to us again. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The protection of God. When you think of the protection of God, this is a principle that's found throughout the Bible. You, you always read about the Lord being close to those or near to those that call upon him. Uh, we're studying Romans on Sunday afternoons, and we're not in chapter 10, but in Romans chapter 10, verse 12, it says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And so God extends himself to those who call upon him. The only condition that we find in Psalm 145, according to verse 19, is that we fear him. There's the condition. You know, you can think of somebody who just was recently saved, somebody that maybe they don't know what we know. And yet, the, the truth of the scripture is that they're, they're, they're not going to draw closer to God by their knowledge. They're going to draw closer to God by their fear, their fear of God. So verse 19, I'll read it again. And it says, he will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. So that's a condition. We fear him. If we fear the Lord, then we will be humble before him. If we fear the Lord, we will grow in wisdom. That's what the Bible says. The beginning of wisdom is what? It's the fear of the Lord. If we fear the Lord, according to the scriptures, he also will hear our cry and will save us. This is the promise of God. So, having a head full of Bible knowledge is good. Having a head full of Bible knowledge without a fear of the Lord is useless. There's a lot of Christians like that. And I don't mean to pick on any particular Christian, but, you know, there's a lot of Christians that get a head knowledge. And they know things. And, you know, you could, you could ask them a question and they know the answer. And yet, they don't really have a fear of God because they're filled with pride. The Bible tells us that, that knowledge puffeth up. And because of that pride, well, God's waiting for them to be humble. And once they're humble, then he'll listen to them. And I, I find this is just, this is experiential. This is not scripture. It's my opinion. But I find that usually those that are puffed up in knowledge and puffed up in pride because of their knowledge, that the Lord brings things into their life to show them their pride, to show them that they need to be humble in order for them to be able to have fellowship with the Lord. So here's a little golden nuggets for you. Get a grip on this. If you feel that the Lord is not as close to you as maybe you once did, it might be because you've not been calling upon him with the right attitude. That attitude of fear. I don't mean the knee-knocking fear that, you know, you get sometimes when you insulted somebody three times bigger and they're about to pound your face. That's not the kind of fear I'm talking about, although that might be appropriate if you've been living in sin or if you're struggling in something in your life and maybe that knee-knocking fear would help you a little bit. But what I'm really talking about is having a deep and reverential respect for God as you approach him. This is Wednesday night. This is prayer meeting. We are to go before the Lord in prayer tonight. And we're going to pray for quite a list. I've got in my pocket quite a list. And yet if we approach the Lord with the wrong attitude, what good is that? Now, I don't want to 
rock your world. Well, maybe I do. But sometimes the reason why our prayers are never answered is because we've never really prayed. We said things, but our hearts and our attitude toward God has not been right. And because of that, God's not listening. He's not going to answer B, C, and D because he wants you to talk to him about A and B. And until you deal with that, you're not going to find your prayers to be very effective. The Bible tells us the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. So if you're not fearing God as you ought to, most likely it's because you are walking in sin. You're dealing with sin in your life. And if that's the case, you're not fearing God as you ought to, and your prayers are not going to get answered. And I've argued with people about this until I'm blue in the face. They say, well, God hears everything, and God knows everything, and he hears your prayers, and he knows your heart, and he knows your weaknesses. Look, you got some very serious Bible verses you're going to have to explain. You know, verses that tell us that as long as there's sin in my life, I am separated from God. Now, I'm still a son of God. I'm still his adopted child, but I'm separated from him because of sin. He turns his face away and he will not hear. It's not that he cannot hear, but he will not hear until we'll deal with our attitude toward him. When we approach the Lord with the right attitude, with the attitude of fear, he draws close to us. According to the verses, he hears our cries and he will save us. Sometimes the Lord allows us to sink deep down into some big miry problem simply to cause us to look up you know the best time to look up is well the only thing you can do when you're flat on your back is to look up and sometimes that's what god does he puts us flat on our backs because he wants us to look up when we approach the lord with the right attitude he draws close to us he hears our cries he will save us this is a great promise, the great promise of his protection, but it's not a promise without conditions. The fact is, if you are, if you're living before the Lord as you ought to, if you're walking with the Lord as you ought to, and then for whatever crazy reason, and I don't know why any Christian would think this, but we do, you decide to step out from underneath God's protection, God's umbrella of protection, and go out and sow your wild oats or do whatever you think that you want to do out there, you know, God is not obligated to protect you. Now, sometimes he still will. But he's not obligated to. The obligation from the word of God is that when we approach him with fear, he hears us. He saves us. So there it is. There is the promise, but there's the condition. So the question we need to ask ourselves tonight is, do I fear the Lord? I mean, do I really fear the Lord? If I were to walk up to you and I would say to you, I would say, I'd say, Willie, do you fear the Lord? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's the right answer. Everybody knows it. Right? I say, Isaac, do you fear the Lord? No. Nobody ever says that. And yet, at the same time, that's not always the way that we live. Let's move on to verses 20 and 21. Psalm 145, verses 20 and 21. So we had the, the protection of God, but now we're looking at the preservation of God. Psalm 145, verses 20 and 21. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. Mm -hmm. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Mm -hmm. The preservation of God is a wonderful promise. I, I often tell people that, you know, if I had to keep myself saved, I would be in trouble. That's right. if, I, if I could lose my salvation because of sin... I would lose my salvation every day. And so would you. And we would be in the position of having to try to get saved over and over and over again. But according to Hebrews chapter 6, that can't happen. So the bottom line is, sometimes we sin and we fall, but God still preserves us because we're still his child. And sometimes he allows us to fall. To teach us that our way is a way that leads to destruction. It's a great promise, a wonderful promise. The Lord preserves those that love him. There are quite a number of promises to God's preservation. Uh, 
you know, I was looking through the Bible and I had to literally say, no, okay, okay, I've got this whole big long list here that I could use. Let me just share three. So I want to share three verses with you. Turn to Psalm chapter, I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 2, verse 8. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 8. Proverbs 2, verse 8, speaking of God, it says, He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. He preserves the way of his saints. Your way, if it's his way, <laughs> is preserved. You're never going to wake up with the realization that God is no longer your father. You know, there's these two words that go together in the Bible, eternal life, or if you prefer to say everlasting, that's fine too, everlasting life. What kind of life is it if it is not eternal? It's not worth much if it's not eternal. When Jesus gave his life on the cross for you and I, he didn't give his life so that we could have something temporarily until we blew it and lost it. The Bible tells us, for by one offering he hath perfected, how long? Forever. Then they're sanctified. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23. Does anybody know what a tripartite being means? Does anybody know what tripartite means? Or how about bipartite? There's some people that are bipartite, which means they believe that the soul and the spirit are the same and the body is different. So man is, you know, soul and spirit and body, bipartite. There are others that are tripartite, body, soul, and spirit. What does the Bible say? That's the question. Notice this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Now let's stop there for a moment. Who is it that's going to sanctify me? In other words, set me apart. Holy set me apart. Not me, God. If it was up to me, failing every day as I do, I could not very well be sanctified wholly. But God sanctifies me wholly. And notice the next part. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body, three parts, be preserved blameless. What? Be preserved blameless. You probably don't feel very blameless right now. I don't know very many people who, being honest, would say that they feel blameless. And yet, in some way, somehow, God is going to preserve us blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. I said I wasn't going to share but three verses, but that's not working so well for me right now. Philippians 1, verse 6 tells us that th we have that kind of confidence in the Lord that he which hath begun a good work in us will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So guess what? God, first of all, God's not finished with you. You are imperfect. We are all imperfect. We're imperfect, but we're not finished. He's going to perform the work that he started in us until the day of Jesus Christ. When is that day? Well, I wish I knew, but I don't. That's either going to be the rapture or death. You might go one of two ways, but... In either case, he's going to preserve you until that time comes, at which, at which point you'll be perfect in heaven and won't need to worry about it anymore. Turn to Jude chapter 1 and verse 1. Jude chapter 1 and verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ, and called. Mm -hmm. You don't keep yourself. You don't preserve yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's good because every one of us would fail miserably in trying to do that job. You are preserved in Jesus Christ. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that. When Christ is my Savior, He preserves me. He preserves all of His saints. We read that earlier on. And associated with this promise of preservation is this equally wonderful promise that someday the Lord is going to punish the wicked. That is a precious promise. What would heaven be like if everybody went there? It would be like this. 
that we live in this world down here. <clears throat> the only problem with that would be it would be for an eternity. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to stick around in this kind of mess for eternity. I'd like to know that there is going to come a point, the Bible tells us, there's going to come a point when, when the Lord is going to judge the wicked. And that's a promise. It's a blessed promise. We need to remember that. So that is equally wonderful to me. For those who rejoice in God's righteousness, and again, if I were to ask you, do you rejoice in God's righteousness? Every one of us would say, yeah, I rejoice in God's righteousness. The judgment of the wicked then becomes a blessing to us. And you're thinking, well, I don't know about right now because, you know, my mom or my dad or my brothers or sisters or whoever, they're not saved and I really don't want them to be judged. I don't want them to be judged because they're lost and they're wicked. Well, I guarantee you that the day will come when you will know perfectly the righteousness of God and you'll know perfectly that they deserve it. And it won't bother you when you're in heaven to know that God is punishing the wicked. The judgment of the wicked is a blessing to us. Now, I want you to follow this thought because up to this point in the psalm, what's happened to us? We've been challenged to praise the Lord. Why? His personal greatness in verse 3. We're also challenged to praise him for his wonderful works in verses 4 through 6. We've been challenged to praise him for his great mercy and his compassion in verses 7 and 8. We praise him for his provisions, verses 14 through 17. We praise him for his protection, verses 18 and 19, and now we praise him for his preservation. Should we not also praise him for his judgment then? Because that's where the psalm ends. It ends with his judgment upon the wicked. Verse 21, if you look at verse 21, this is a statement of determination. It says, my mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name Forever and ever. This is a statement of determination. This is, this is the psalmist. This is David saying, this is what I'm going to do. I am going to praise God. You ever have one of those days you didn't feel like praising him? Praise him anyway. You're alive. You'll make it. You'll go to sleep and wake up with a brand new day tomorrow. I guarantee you. That's just the way things kind of go. So praise him anyway. David ends the psalm by purposing to praise the Lord. But not only he, he says all flesh. As we go through the end of the Psalms, from Psalm 145 through the end, through, through the end of the Psalms, you're going to find that this same idea is reoccurring. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. That's where, where the le very last Psalm ends in the very last verse of the Psalm. And that's what we need to do tonight. Sometimes we approach God in prayer and we're burdened and that's good. We should be burdened. There are burdens to bear. But I think along with that, we ought to be able to praise him a little bit too. Because he's good. He's merciful. He's protected us. He's provided for us and he's preserved us. So there's a lot that we can praise the Lord for. So we'll end with prayer and then we'll break up into our groups. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you so much for preserving us. Thank you so much for protecting us. And Lord, as we've meditated upon that tonight... We see your goodness toward them that, that love you. And Father, we, we do love you. But often, Lord, uh, even as I say that, sometimes, Lord, I know we feel a bit like Peter that said, Lord, you know that we love you, and yet we fail you. But you've never failed us. When, when we're faithless, you're still faithful. We're so thankful for that. We ask now, Lord, as we go into prayer, that our hearts will be prepared, that we'll approach you with the right attitude, and that we'll praise you for your goodness toward us. And we thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now let's break up into groups and go to prayer.